Hello and welcome to Excelling in Christ. Today we're going right to the heart of Christianity. I mean, we're going to the very core of what it means to excel in Christ. This is why we exist. This is why we pursue our Christianity. I'm going to start with a little story, but first, if you find value in this, the best support you can give is simply to share it. Now, back in 2010, there was a multimillionaire named Forrest Finn. And he decided he wanted to share the thrill of the hunt with other people. He was a treasure hunter. And so he hid $2 million in a bronze case in the Rocky Mountains in New Mexico. And for 10 years, people went looking for that treasure. It's actually reported that five people died while looking for that treasure. Then in 2020, June 6th, a medical student found the treasure and the hunt was over. Now, the stories like that are fun, whether you like them in the book, like what Forrest Finn wrote, or whatever you like to watch them on TV. We like those kind of stories. We think, man, that's kind of neat. And we all are a bit of a dreamer ourselves. After all, why did you get married? You were dreaming of a happy relationship or started a career. You were dreaming of success. We all look for a treasure. It's just that we look for it in different ways. So why do we dream about treasures? And the answer is really simple. God created us to seek treasures. Now, that is very much taught in the Bible, but it doesn't get a lot of attention. And this really gets us down to the core of our spiritual development. So in Proverbs 25 and verse 2, we read, the glory of God is to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search it out. God created us to go on a treasure hunt. God created us to be part of this enjoyable process of seeking out treasures. Now, Jesus taught the same thing, and you're probably familiar with this passage. It's over in Matthew 7. It's verse 7 and 8, where he says, Seek and you'll find, knock, and it'll be open to you. And so spiritual excellence is about that athletic mindset, about that, that striving for excellence, being the best you can be. That's the ultimate treasure, almost the ultimate treasure, that we're looking for. And when you understand that this is kind of like that athletic mindset, this is a training process, this isn't like a trip to Walmart where you go down and you pick up 15, 20, 30 items and you check them off your list. This is a lifelong process of continuing to hone skills and dial in to your heart. Spiritual excellence is like athletic excellence. It's much more than a trip to Walmart and buying some things. It's not just hearing, believing, repenting, and being baptized. It is a lifelong process of development where we really learn to dial in and tune into our heart. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's, that's part of the treasure hunt. That's part of the training process. Jesus also used that spiritual hunt analogy when he said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found, and over joy he goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. That's Matthew 13 and 44. In the very next two verses he says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. And when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold it and he bought it. And that's what we're looking for, that spiritual pearl of great price. So it, it takes an effort, it takes an intention, it takes a deliberateness to get there. This is not handed to us on a silver platter. God wants us to participate in the process. And our participation is not just a few minutes or a dabbling. It's a present your body a living sacrifice type of participation. And of course, the treasure we're looking for is far more than two million dollars. It's crazy value that we're looking for here. You can't even put a price tag on these things. I'm talking about things like Philippians 4, 6, and 7, where he talks about the peace that passes understanding. This is what we're looking for. Or maybe you're thinking of Ephesians 3 and 19, where he says we can know the love that surpasses knowledge. How many people do you know that would love to actually experience 
that kind of peace and that kind of love. And then we ask 1 Peter 1 and 8, where he says there is joy inexpressible full of glory. Now, I don't know about you, but I think those three make an awesome treasure now. And I do mean now this side of the tombstone. And then, of course, there's that treasure that we look forward to in heaven. Uh, these three are not the ultimate treasure. The ultimate treasure is God himself. And this is what gets us really to the core of what excelling in Christ is and drawing near to God is and this, this whole thing about being the best Christian you can be. Jesus said in John 17 and 3 that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I think a lot of people are aiming way too low. The ultimate target, the ultimate goal is God himself, to know our Father. Now, Paul, when he's talking on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 26 through verse 28, tells us exactly why we are here on earth, the very purpose, and he says it word for word, and it's one of those passages that, again, doesn't get much attention. It gets read over pretty quick. First, Paul tells his audience that God made all men of one nation, and that's in verse 26. And then he says the reason God made all men was so that they should seek the Lord. We are here to seek out a relationship with God. And we will find our deepest happiness, our deepest joy, when we do what God designed us to do. Now, I believe it's possible to endure life without doing any of this. I think most people do just exist and somehow manage to get paycheck to paycheck, so to speak, but they never know that deep peace, that deep love, that, that deep joy. And all Satan has to do is distract them a little bit, and I'll be honest, I think Satan substitutes are a lot of fun. That's why we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, because what the distractions, the distractions the world offers, uh, they are fun. I wouldn't argue that point with you at all. So Satan doesn't have to make you the vilest person on the planet. All he has to do is distract you from seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if he can distract you and cause you to put God in number two, three, or four slot in your life, then Satan has won. Now, of course, God doesn't want Satan to win, but this is a two-way street. God does his part in the relationship. We have our part in the relationship. And Paul encourages us in that same Acts 17, verse 26 through 28 passage, that we live and move in God. He's not really that far away, I think is what Paul is saying. And then he says, we are his offspring. Now I want you to picture that a second. He's talking to a pagan audience, and he's looking at these people who are worshiping every idol they can imagine, and he says, we are God's offspring. Part of the wonderful treasure we are looking for is not just the academic understanding that we're God's offspring, but that experiential understanding that you are God's creation. As David would say, God created you in your mother's womb. Not just abstract, you are God's offspring. You are here because God created you. God never looked down on this planet one time and, and took a gasp of breath and thought, wow, I didn't know you were here. He knew you were coming from the beginning. He planned you and he knew what you would do and he knew how you would stumble and he let you come into this world anyway. Now, when that becomes an experiential thing, not just an academic thing, but a thing of the heart, now you've gained some more of your treasure. You moved the hunt further. And so God's not trying to keep us from finding him. He's not moving away every time we get closer to him. He wants us to find him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And a relationship, of course, is a two-way street. So Jesus opened the way of reconciliation for us. So when we intensely focus on seeking God, 
that's when we start feeling like we're really getting some traction in this spiritual thing and we have some purpose and some meaning just beyond doing our chores and paying the bills and playing some games or just you know going to church or something we're really going hey there's something to this now there are a lot of folks <laughs> men usually I just want to follow simple points. You know, give me five things to check off my list. Can I hear, believe, baptize, be, repent, and be done with it? Just, just let me sit on the pew till I die. No, relationships don't work that way. God doesn't want to be treated like you picked him up at the fast food drive through or, or something like that. He does not want to be treated like an item for you to check off your to-do list. He's looking for a relationship and not a lukewarm relationship, not a mediocre relationship, but a very, very deep relationship. I think the marriage analogy would help explain a little bit of something here. I want you to imagine you're in a marriage, or maybe you are, and you don't have to imagine. Do you want to be treated just like an atom on your mate's to-do list? I've seen marriages literally fall apart, and this, again, usually the fault of men because we're not as emotionally connected. Uh, and they, they do the five things they think are important for their wife. You know, they pay the bills, they have fridge full of groceries, they take out the trash, they mow the grass, and they think she ought to be happy. And I guess if her love language is acts of service, she'll be quite happy. Otherwise... Women don't want to be treated just like an item on a man's to-do list. They want a relationship. And if we're wise, we as men want a deep, heart-connected relationship too. And the reason we're that way is because we're created in the image of God. And God doesn't want us just going through a checklist. He wants a heart connection. That is why I said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So it's not just getting God to help us with our agenda. If I may put it in a paraphrase, God is our agenda. As Christ said in John 17, 3, to know God, that's eternal life. So this seeking God is stated a lot of times in the Old Testament. I lost count when I got to around 50. In the New Testament, not as often and really doesn't get a lot of attention. But Hebrews 11.6 would be my other favorite passage to go to to really emphasize that we are here, we're created in this life to seek God. That, that is the, the core purpose of, of being Christian, and that's where you're going to find your traction. So Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So number one, you got to have faith. That's the first part of the verse. Then we have that diligently seek him at the last part of the verse. And the faith is absolutely essential. There were 350,000 people that went looking for Forrest Finn's treasure. Now, there are about 300 million people in America. Now, obviously, a lot of people just couldn't take time off and go search for the treasure. I get that. But there were other people in the area who didn't go search for it because they didn't believe it. There were people who thought he was lying and that he was just making a fool of people until it was discovered. And then they realized, oh, he wasn't just playing games. So you have to believe that God is there. You have to believe that these rewards that we've talked about these on this side of the tombstone are there. And you have to have that faith to diligently seek him. The reason that some people just never really get off the ground spiritually is they don't diligently seek Him. And they stick Him way down there on their to-do list, you know, 10th, 15th, 20th, and God won't play second place to anyone. God rewards those that give Him their all. Unfortunately, some are seeking God just so they can get things out of God. And because they're just trying to use God to their own advantage, they never get off the ground spiritually. 
So one more observation, and we'll bring this little cast to a close, and that is the rewards of seeking God begin today. No question about it. There's that peace that passes understanding, the love that surpasses knowledge, that joy inexpressible. There's prayer, comfort of the words, your church family, better marriages, better families, just all of those things that happen now before we die. Christianity is not just about when you die but about living the best life you can this side of the tombstone before you die. And thanks for listening. Appreciate you taking your time with me. If you found value in this and would like to support this program, the number one, the best thing you can do is simply share this with someone else. And I believe that together we can make a difference. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day.